Um, welcome to um, our panel, our wonderful panel. Um, this edition of Dev Days, we're launching something new, which is uh, Women for Fire. Um, and it's an initiative by um, a few thought leaders in the in the fire community who will um, introduce themselves in, in, in a moment. Uh, but before we do, um, there's a stream on uh, Zulip, Women for Fire stream that um, was launched for this initiative, for this panel, for this uh, Women for Fire. And we also have uh, Q&A either in Zulip or um, in Hoover. So we'll take your questions um, after 50 minutes of panel, uh, either here in the room or online. And we did a quick head count um, before the panel. We have 25% um, women at Dev Days, offline and online, um, which is, I think, kind of good news because the last time we did this, I think it was in Redmond, um, we had less than 20%. So we're getting there. Um, so let's start with brief introductions and maybe you can, each of you can introduce yourself and tell us why you decided to join the panel and launch this initiative. Um, Vivian, would you like to start? Sure, yeah, thank you. Uh, Vivian Neely, I am the Fire Product Manager at Google um, and my running, oh, yeah. Um, I always joke my first dev days, I did, it was my first time in Amsterdam and I didn't leave the hotel after going to all the sessions because I was so terrified of um, being new to the community and not having friendly faces in the community. And so it was really important to me to uh, make this a little bit more of a welcoming place for people. Thanks. My name is Michaela Ziegler. I work as an e-health solution consultant at Ardis, and I uh, am a former physiotherapist, and I joined my first Dev Days in 2019. And then after two days, I got really frustrated and asked me, am I really at the right place as a non-techie? Non yeah, the fact that I am a woman um, didn't uh, push my self-confidence. So I like to um, talk about that and join the other really nice persons here. Um, is this working? Yeah. yeah. My name is Simone Heckmann. I'm from Germany. I'm CEO of Gefira. And um, we're providing training and consultancy in Germany and German-speaking countries. And... I have pretty much been at Dev Days since forever. <laughs> like from the very first Dev Days, uh, I haven't missed a single one. And I don't know whether it's lack of awareness on my part, but I never noticed any kind of issues connected to gender. I always felt very warmly welcome in the community. And yeah, I think 25% is a good enough number considering that this is mostly a technical topic that may not apply to every woman out there but if there's anything that we can improve to make this more welcoming to women I'm all for it so yeah I'm looking forward to this discussion. Hi I'm Virginia Lorenzi uh, have been advocating for standards-based interoperability since way before fire before the turn of the century um, and uh, computer scientists work at New York Presbyterian, work at Columbia, consider myself, you know, work in HL7 and, you know, mom caregiver. And I think it's really important we be welcoming. And I've spent a good amount of my career kind of trying to overcompensate for, for the fact that I was a girl, I was a dumb blonde, I was annoying and wouldn't shut up. Um, but uh, I do want to say that I love the name Woman for Fire, because I think Fire is a very empowering tool for women. And so I really believe in that. Thank you. Okay, let's start with you then, Virginia. Why do you think fire is a, a powerful tool for women specifically? So I think fire is an empowering tool for women because sometimes what happens as a woman, and things may be changing because I'm old. I know I don't look it right. Um, but... Uh, Why'd you laugh? Okay, so um, is that, you know, 
sometimes as a woman, you, you, you make some choices in your life, some hard choices in your life, and you make choices and you decide, gee, I guess I don't want to miss all three of my kids crawl at once. You know, I got pregnant with triplets. You know, I became a patient. I felt what that was like. And then I was taking care of three children and stepchildren and husband and the aunt and uncle down the street and the mom and the dad and whatever. Women very much end up in a caregiver role. And a fire is something where you could maybe actually get your data and maybe you could speak back. And in that way, I think it's a very empowering tool for women. Not that men don't, might not fall into these roles too, but for those reasons. Thank you. So there's... um. Uh, in the Julep, you you will find the link to a blog post by Graham from 2017 about the uh, women in the fire community, and you can all find it there. The link, um, and um, Graham pointed out that the um, fire community was regarded by the women that he interviewed as a welcoming community. So my question basically is, what is a welcoming community for women, and is there anything that we could do better? Uh, Vivian, you want to take that? A welcoming community. What does it mean? Sure. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to go to dinner with some amazing people last night, and we had a lot of these conversations. And I think just having this theme, being able to have that conversation and kind of have that opening uh, to talk about it already is the start. And I left the, you know, I left dinner and said to myself, wow, there's a bunch of really great advocates in that room. And I thought, what made them advocates? Um, and it was truly the fact that they were all willing to listen. And I think that having the conversation and listening are two sides to the same coin when it comes to the problems and hearing out. And, and that's so much, that goes so far to be felt and, and welcomed into. And who wants to take the second part of the question? What can we do better? Because let's not be, um to applauding about ourselves, right? There's some, there got to be something that we can do better. Well, I'm not sure if I have the solution that you're looking for, but I think an important factor for women being new to the community is to see other women who are already there and are feeling good and are integrated into the community. So, but I think that is particularly Deaf Days has always done a really great job with, uh, uh, putting women into the speaker role. And I wish we had the numbers for this test days. And I forgot to ask you beforehand, like what the percentage is on the speaker side uh, well, of women. But I would probably assume that it's even higher than on the participant side. Which yeah, well, the keynotes are mainly uh, women. There you are. Yeah, there. And that's a wonderful thing to do. I think that's really important. And, and I think Deaf Days have always done a great job with that. Well, let's uh, applause again. So I'm trying to figure out what we can do get better. Uh, okay, so um, I'm just trying to uh, understand, we roll into interoperability. And suppose that the, the fire community had a better balance from the start, right? 50-50, say 50-50. Where would we have been now? Would, have, would it have been different or better or just the same? Because it was initially, it was just a bunch of guys, right? And me. <laughs> and you. <laughs> so, okay. So I think, I think Simona, this question is for you. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think that I can answer that. I think that in the beginning, probably fire was approached very much from a technical perspective. And so it was really... But very much looked at from the implementation standpoint. And I think as soon as fire got broader in scope and it became more uh, like a, a discussion that went far beyond writing code, I think that's pretty much when uh, more engagement happened with a far wider community in general, not just women, just you know, different groups of, of professions that, that were um, uh, integrated into the community. What would have been different if we had Except if we, if we had talked to like practitioners and patients and nurses from the very beginning, I think that's an, an important discussion to have. Whether the number of percentage of women being present would have changed anything, I don't know. So um, I have <laughs> very strong opinions on this because there are a lot of things I would have done different if um, I could go back in time and join as a child. Um, and, but I think. <laughs> 
The first thing is um, I find a tendency where women think of their health data and health information as a much more private uh, piece of information. And I think the fact that, you know, smart V2 is just now coming about and consent is now just coming about. Um, I promise we probably would have brought consent in very early on ah. and that kind of level of secure access and, and um, consideration about kind of where your data is going and who's looking at it is really tends to be um, something, especially uh, women in the U.S. care about. And then I think there's another thing. Um, there's just certain fields of implementation. I've pulled five different men, all fire leaders, and got five different answers on how to document a menstrual cycle. And I think that's really interesting. Like we think about that all the time and we don't have one way to do this. That's, you know, I think those are the kind of things where um, if not that, you know, you weren't enough, but you said 25% is enough. And I think there's just, there's not, there's never an answer that's enough because um, those are the small things that get changed. I think and probably that's because I'm really looking at it from the technical endpoint. I'm kind of looking at a specific specification aspect and less on, on the actual usage, which which is a totally different story. Um, like how do we use fire? Um, I've always kind of had the focus on the implementation and technical stuff part. So uh, what you mentioned like about how to model uh, menstrual cycle is not really uh, something that I have to do with in my daily work. So I, I'm Again, lack of awareness on my part, I guess. <laughs> okay, so um, what do you think? Where will we be um, in three years from now or five years from now um, when you look at the participants or the, the examples that you mentioned, consent or menstrual uh, um, modeling in, in the fire spec? Will it be different? Will we be at 50-50 or is it Michaela? Um, hopefully at least 50 50 <laughs> at least 50 um, I think I would love to continue this community fire uh, women for fire and uh, have a look how far we can get and I think a very important uh, point is to just be aware that not for all people um, or not from all perspective it is a big issue but it's just it is a difference and um let's talk about this topic and um, um be aware and change made a perspective um how to look at the at the point i think that would be very helpful to to continue and let's talk about in three years and how would we want to continue this initiative? Do you have any suggestions, uh, Women for Fire? Should we continue this? And, in, and if so, in what way? I saw a question in Hoova similar to this. Is, 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 do we have plans or is it just this? Um, I would like to continue at least on SULIP and may in advance of uh, future death days, we could just... Uh, be more um, present and more um, uh, there for starters, even if they're women or a man. For and, new, um, you know, first time. Yeah, exactly. First timers and uh, say, hey, we are here and just talk to us and reduce the, the burden to, to get in is the it, community. Is it different to be a first timer as a woman as it is? To be a first timer as a man. So, I talked today to a good friend of mine, and he said yes. What? Why? And and what is it that we men don't see that is so obvious that we overlook? Okay. <laughs> well, I think there's a question. I'm not asking you, Gino. I'll ask your wife. <laughs> I think the level of nerdiness at Dev Day is alarming to any newcomer. Out there. The level I'm pretty nerdiness. sure that that's a fact that it's totally overwhelming for anyone who comes here first time, new to the fire topic, and it gets blasted with the amount of information and expertise that's out there. And I think everyone would <laughs> probably. So why is nerdiness more intimidating for a woman than it is for a man, Virginia? So it has to do with traditional fields that people have gone in. You know, computer science has now become a field which has flexibility, right? 
we can work from home. You know, before you couldn't do that as a computer scientist. I don't know why, but you couldn't do that. So women chose roles that were more flexible and women were also seen as caregivers, right? So they got in those caregiver roles. If you want to get to 50%, find a way to get all those nurses. And now we have nurse informaticists by the droves. Get them here. They are the original hackers. They will get things done. And also the other role is medical records people. It looks like they don't have paper anymore, mm -hmm. but they understand data and they understand go data governance and they're full of women. Get them here and tell them they're of value. And these people are detail oriented. They can do this stuff. They can tell you what you have wrong. And then that wonderful unpaid profession, get the caregivers here. And in terms of representation, I do not think caregivers represented well in fire. And the whole family dynamic thing, I don't think is there. It's complex. I've lived it. Hmm. So we did the nurse, uh, the nerd, not the nurse, the nerds track. We had uh, three or four people applying, all men. Is 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 nerdiness something for men? Why 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 is it not appealing for women? No, I don't. Oh, um, there's someone in the room. Okay, Set with an opinion. Stand up, please. Uh, do we have a mic in the room? Oh my gosh! Don't. What? What? I didn't want to be. Yeah. Okay. Perfect example. What do we I have some? Do we have a mic? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Um, I don't think um, we can associate nerdiness um, with men. We have lots of nerds who are women. Um, I think there's a limitation, as she mentioned, um, with all the fields that women choose. Now that is changing. Um, now we have more women in tech. Um, so I really love this. Um, I think sometimes we feel lonely because there, there are less of us and events like this. And uh, we never had role models, like we never had speakers. So um, again, having more women uh, as speakers that can really help, um, but then just forcing it, I don't, I don't feel very, um, I don't think that's the right thing to do. We don't have 50 50 at the moment like when I graduated we only had 10 percent women in uh, electrical and computer so targeting 50 50 is not realistic yet hopefully it will be it will happen soon um so yeah I really so it's a matter this. of time yeah, exactly. So we, did, we it took us four years to go from twenty to twenty-five, so we can do the math. It will it, happen. I I think with the right mentorship, right? Uh, and the role models. New, exactly, women are new uh, into this, so yeah, we should really mentor them. So having this, I love it. Um, Good. I hope we continue doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, uh, let's go to the room. Any questions from the room for the panel? Or comments, also welcome. Hi, um, so there have been many studies about communication and different ways that men and women communicate in the way that they are perceived when they do. And it often finds its way into the workplace and meetings, et cetera. Um, and one of the recent findings that I remember reading was that women often, um, they say less in meetings, but then the perception of particularly men after they do speak is that they spoke way more than they did. Um, so this kind of ties into the whole feeling annoying thing. Um, the, the discomfort with, uh, public communication. Um, have any of you experienced that in the workplace related to um, your work in healthcare and with fire? Oh, I'm pretty sure that I'm widely percepted as a person who speaks all the time and never shuts up. But I, <laughs> in all honesty, I have to admit they are right. <laughs> I think that's such a good um, thought. So I, I mentioned I had an amazing dinner last night, a great company. And the first thought that I got home is, oh my gosh, 
I talked too much. They're not going to like me. And I had to say, you know, the question was why I think do women not feel as included on their first time? And I think we tend to have such um, a more severe case of imposter syndrome. Like, I still can't believe I'm having this conversation with you right now. Um, I, I might get uninvited next year, unsure. But I think I think that plays into a lot of this where, you know, we also have to feel comfortable and confident. And um, as advocates, I think recognizing that the imposter syndrome is real and um, always continuing to like lift, lift others up and speak, you know, uh, great things about the work that women in our community are doing and continue to kind of elevate all of this awesome work is so needed because um, so much of us feel that kind of imposter uh, at every given time. And I, and I think those things are really important for this. But I, I totally agree. I, 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 um, communication and shout out to Dan, who is just talking about this. We're looking at kind of respectful communication with NHL 7 and what does that look like as well? And I think that's a that's a great comment. Where are we in time? Do we have one final question or is it, are we? No? Oh, gosh. Well, then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, sorry? Oh, okay. So um, I hope this is the beginning of something um, that, we'll, um, that we will be able to repeat. And certainly there's the stream on Zulip where this will live and hopefully until the next death days. Uh, Virginia, Simone, and Michaela in um, Vivian, thanks so much for being here, for being on stage and being a role model and, be, and uh, taking this initiative, um, and hopefully see you next time. <laughs>